lovelies. To those of us who are here till the end of the day, you're still here, you're still smiling, this is all very hopeful. And I'm very, very pleased to be up here on the stage for our mayoral forum. Um, I have no idea how much of an introduction these lovely people need, but before we do that, I'm going to do one of those awful MC things that people sometimes do. Please excuse my back. Um, who was it? Marai Tukere, earlier today in our Strategic Partners Forum, laid down a little bit of a wedal for us, a little bit of a challenge. And the first thing that came out of her mouth on that stage was, I want to hear us all say Waikato properly. She yeah. said, no more cats in this room. I don't want to hear any cats, any Waikato. And so um, that was the challenge. And, so, and now, even though I'm sure the majority of us are really, really, really good at saying Waikato, we are just going to have a quick practice because if nothing else you can leave today saying we all know how to say it perfectly and we've all said it perfectly. All right, so first of all, we're going to ask why. Why? 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 One more time. Why? why? Right, now we're going to go driving in our car. Car. One more time. Car. Put them together. Why? Car. Again. Why? Car. All right, excellent. Then someone wrote me a really mean, nasty note and I tore it up. Tore. Say, tore. Tore. Why? Car. Tore. High five each other. Listen to that. How good was that? All right, excellent. I know it's awful. It's awful when people do things like that to you. Um, but as someone who is studying to do Māori full time this year, at Waikato University, Ki Tauranga, at the Tauranga campus. I can tell you, and also as an English teacher, right, so from way back, I, I was an English teacher back in the day, uh, I can tell you that our ability to pronounce Te Reo Māori or not pronounce Te Reo Māori is purely psychological, because there is not a single sound that we use in the Māori language that we don't also use in English. It's just our brain going, oh, different language, this is hard. Right, so that's your challenge. Forget about the spelling, forget about how you think it should sound, just listen, repeat, why, car, tour, those are all sounds that we already know how to make. And now I'll stop being bossy. You can't keep the teacher out of me, right? Okay, on stage with me for our mayoral forum, we have Paula Southgate, our, the mayor of the Hamilton City Council. We have Linda Te Aho, the uh, Te Aratauta board member and former chair. We have Max Baxter, the Mayor of Botorahanga, and Alan Sanson, the Mayor of the Waikato District Council. Can we give them a round of applause, please? <laughs> now, the Waikato plan was born from the mayoral forum, so who better to hear from, especially as we draw our day to a close, than the Waikato mayors that have influenced the current Waikato plan. And so we're going to discuss uh, that with them and also what the road ahead might lead to. First of all, I will hand the time over to each of our panellists to just introduce themselves. And, oh, it does say one fun fact about your community. Oh, we're really warming things up at the end of the day. I like that face there, Alan. Well done. Nice. Why didn't you do a home Kia ora tato. Um, I would like to acknowledge my colleague Martin Gallagher here too, by the way, who sits... Um, on the Waikato plan for us. So I'm the Mayor of Hamilton, Kirikirirua, and we have a piece of life-size art by Weta Workshops in the heart of our city. Does anybody know what it is? Sorry? Yeah, it's the Riffraff statue. So the Riffraff statue was designed by Weta Workshops, sits outside our museum at the moment, and it commemorates Richard O'Brien, who is a Hamiltonian who wrote the Rocky Horror Picture Show. And he's getting a Hamilton Medal in a few days. So there you go. There you go. That's my fact. Thank you so much. Linda, over to you. That's uh, already on. Kia ora koutou, tō tahi mihi atu ki a koutou katoa, ko whae te mai nei te nei rā. Linda, te aho tōku ingoa, no wai katoa ahau. Um, Te Aratauta, um, perhaps one fun fact about Waikato Tainui is that we operate in a boundaryless way, which is a little bit different from, um, say, what the councils often do. So an example, Manaki talked earlier about how we responded during the COVID crisis, 
And no matter where our whānau lived and no matter where our whānau were, we tried our very best to make sure that they were being looked after by partnering with other iwi or other communities. Lines on maps didn't matter to us. Kia ora, thank you so much. Yeah, kia ora tātou, ko Max Nash to tōku ingoa. Yeah, I was thinking back to fun things about um, Otorohonga and the district. Now, I'm sure most of you in the room would have um, heard of the um, department store in London called Harrods. Well, in 1986, um, Al Fayed, who was the owner of Harrods, um, decided to lay a legal case against um, a guy by the name of Henry Harrod in Palmerston North. They had a restaurant. They wanted to open a restaurant and call it Harrods. Well, Otorohonga saw this um, as an opportunity and renamed itself Harrodsville. And all the shops in town called themselves Harrods for a period of time until the legal case was dropped. And they got international recognition. Now, considering this is before digital um, technology as well, um, they got international recognition across the UK, Greece, Saudi Arabia, Australia, and Canada. So, as, you know, for a period of time, 1986, um, Otorohonga was Harrodsville. <laughs> Max, also, can I just tell you that when I was born, my dad was the sole traffic cop in Otorohonga. Yes, that is my, that's my claim to fame. Right, I'm still trying. I don't know about that, claim to fame. <laughs> I might have met him. You might have. No, I don't think so. Probably met a few of them up in my part of the world. Um, look, this is an interesting one. You know, when I went through these questions yesterday, I looked at them and I thought, the one I got stuck on was this one. And, and I thought, what do they mean by that? And so I, my EA put out a, a thing to some of the staff and they came back and said to me, and I've got it written down here, that the Waikato district is only 10% smaller than Auckland, geographically. So that's a little bit of the you. So that just gives you an understanding of the geographics. But a fun thing of Waikato district, and there is lots of fun things, So, but one that's more commonly picked on, I remember uh, probably about eight years ago, I was in Europe, and, and when you're in Germany, and you're looking for a book to read, unless you can speak Deutsche, it's actually not easy to find a book. But I did find a Lonely Planet, and when I opened up the Lonely Planet and looked at New Zealand, there was one thing in there about New Zealand. Do you know what that was? Ragland. And it's left-hand surf. So there you go, there's the fun factor. And Joe sitting down there will know that very well. So, yeah, that's the, the fun thing about the Waikato. Kia ora. All right, thank you very much for that. So our first question, because we have Rangatahi here, we've had such awesome contributions from our Rangatahi today. Our first question to each of you is about how are youth currently engaged in your communities and, and with your agency? So Paula, can we start with you? Yes, you can. So we do have our community development teams who have a key focus on youth and work alongside all of the community youth groups and have a dedicated staff member to that. In addition, uh, we've actually done a lot of work over the last three years around civic education. Uh, before the last election, and we're continuing with that now, we even did a mock council meeting where we asked the schools to put up um, youth leaders, and they came over and came across and took over our council um, chambers for a day and did mock voting, and the topics that they were asked to think about were long-term plan proposals. And as a, as a result of that, um, we got more submissions to our long-term plan by youth than we've ever had before. Actually, we got 160% increase on engagement with our LTP. But fair to say, I've never seen so many young people come into chamber. And, and actually, some of them were brave enough to come and stand at the end of the board table and speak to it as well. And we are, uh, we've got a really progressive social media team, so we're looking at all the ways that we can reach out to youth besides the normal ways. And in addition, of course, we prefer to lean into the organisations that are doing something like Zeal, H-Town, Seed, and a lot of others as well to, to help them in their mahi rather than to replicate anything they're doing. So that's the, the approach we take in general. Linda, tell us about Waikato Tainui. Yeah, kia ora. We, we're always looking for, for new and different ways to involve, involve our rangatahi. Um, sitting in a university, I think back right from inception, there's, we've offered tertiary scholarships and grants to students who are, who are studying um, rangatahi and, and not rangatahi, but mostly targeted towards the rangatahi. Um, offering internships in our tribal organisations and one of the really fabulous ones that I remember from last summer was a summer internship programme where I think there are about 
uh, about 11 to 15 um, students, rangatahi, who went out and interviewed marae to ask them what their aspirations were for the future. It was a research project. And then we had an evening where they all presented back their, their research and their whānau and friends came along to, to support the evening. And it was really fantastic hearing marae aspirations and presented through a rangatahi lens. And it's given our staff a whole lot of new ideas as to how to engage rangatahi in their marae communities um, as well. Um, we have uh, a group of rangatahi who attend the iwi leaders forums. Those are all of the iwi chairs from all across the motu and those rangatahi get to engage with others around the country. And finally, um, just during that COVID response period, with some of our rangatahi who led the presentation to the Prime Minister for funding for the Ngāti Rangatahi campaign, which is by rangatahi for rangatahi responses. That's when you got the, um, don't use the word vaccination, use the word did you get dotted and eat a dot, that campaign and the whole um, set of merchandise and then hosting events and so on that were um, encouraging rangatahi to come and get vaccinated. And that was that was funded, I think, in the tune of something like a million dollars where they were able to create digital resources and an adver advertising campaign in order for those numbers of vaccinations to, to get up to the, you know, to the targets that we were seeking. So our rangatahi are awesome. Um, Otorohonga has a real rich history in engaging with their youth and looking after them. In fact, the, my predecessor in this role of mayor was an incredibly great narrator or storyteller. And um, was telling the story about um, Otorohonga having zero youth unemployment. You can twist the figures back and forth a wee bit. But the point is here, what Dale was saying is we're looking after the youth in um, Otorohonga or Rangatahi to ensure they went into sustainable employment. So dating back to about 2004, um, we started a lot of uh, mentoring work around our youth and that there's engaging with them um, from while they're in school and engaging them post leaving school and it all began around um, youth suicides actually in town at the stage. So it was, it was really following up to ensure that the youth had the support that they needed um, across the community. So moving on from 2004 to 2022 where we are now, um, we still have Thrive, which used to be the Harvest Centre back in the day, who still engage now with um, our rangatahi starting as young as um, 11 and 12 years of age, where we have a mentor that goes out to primarily our coastal communities and engages with the, skid, the kids before they uh, move on to high school. Just to make that transition um, way easier, and then also the mentoring carries on in the high school. So um, our rangatahi have this continuum of the same person they're looking at who they're going to, and you may recognise the name Jackson Willison, who's our um, youth mentor that's running across our community doing that at the moment. The follow-up is also about supporting them in CV writing and um, into um, other opportunities in employment or education. Following on from that, the work that I do with Mayor's Task Force for Jobs has now got 29 employment hubs across New Zealand, one of which is in Otorohonga. And that there is about, again, engaging with our rangatahi supporting them and offering the pastoral care that's necessary to ensure that they can stay in um, sustainable employment. And look, it's been absolutely amazing. Um, Elle's here with the team today. Um, you know, what we're seeing is, for, look, for a lot of our rangatahi, they're, they're easy. Um, they go into education, they go into employment, but there's a large percentage that that's not quite so easy now. There's not the support by, from whānau that there used to be. There's not that um, connection with their friends that they once had um, due to um, probably technology as much as anything. So if we can offer them the pastoral care and support um, to stay in sustainable employment, um, that's what we're doing. It's across the country. It's working in Otorohonga. Um, I never knew there were so many jobs available until you actually start going out there and helping, supporting, um, and offering that care that's needed. So yeah, we're doing a heck of a lot. Um, I think you could always do more. That's the thing, you can always do more and we're always looking for funding. Yeah, we're not quite as adventurous as Max. Um, in the past, the Waikato District has identified youth and we have run events to identify what we call um, achievers within the youth sector. Uh, we had a youth aid officer and I see Joe's here today as well, but um, Joe's job was just established a couple of years ago. But a lot of our youth have been given an opportunity to sit at the table uh, around community board and community committees. 
So the Waikato District, because of our size, we have five community boards, which is not every council has these, but we have uh, well in excess of 25 community committees that operate in a similar way and give a focus to the community. And in those areas, a lot of youth have been offered the opportunity to actually sit at the table with their peers um, and um, participate in those discussions around the betterment of their community. And that's all they're wanting in a lot of cases. They're wanting a voice at the top table, and that in a lot of cases is that top table. Kia ora. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I um, am probably a terrible MC because I am known for just shaking things up without any warning. And so I am going to jump ahead to the very last question. Oh, Paula just gave me the eye. It looked, it looked <laughs> scary for a moment there. No. Um, let's just, just because I can, I would really love to hear from each of you. What is your biggest hope and your biggest fear for the Waikato? Currently and looking into the future, what is your biggest hope and your biggest fear? You're all thinking. Who would like to start? Okay, beautiful. Biggest hope. Um, biggest hope that we do, and we've um, listened to Minister Mahuta's address earlier on, and I've listened to the presentations today. Probably my biggest hope is we get to lead a lot of the social initiatives um, from a local level. That we get to lead um, health, we get to lead housing, we get to lead employment and looking after our rangatahi, that we get the opportunity um, where the model changes. We're, we're having stuff taken of us um, in local government. It is now the time to give us something back, and that giving back is the opportunity. And we've talked a lot over the last few years about localism, and localism isn't about councils doing stuff. Localism is about enabling communities to provide services to the community and look after, look after each other. So. I suppose my hope um, going forward is that opportunity arises, um, com communities embrace that opportunity, um, and we're there really supportive and protective of each other. So that's probably my biggest hope. Yeah. Okay, my hopes is all stem around the word better, really. Um, I want to see better outcomes for affordable housing. Uh, we've had a lot of talk about that today and how that might be achieved. We've got a long way to go, we're not there yet. Um, but oh, I'd like to see all of our people out of emergency housing into um, affordable housing of some sort, whether it's rented or uh, sold to them. Uh, I want to see better, stronger education and employment. We are trending the right way in the Waikato. We have this fantastic University of Waikato here. We have the Te Pukenga and uh, Wintec. So we have a lot of excellent schools. Uh, but I want to see the whole educational outcomes for our widest community lifted and that to translate into good opportunities for employment and see our young people stay and harness those opportunities for employment, not necessarily drift off overseas for many, many years before they come back. Better environment is absolutely important to me. We're going to talk about climate later, so I'll cover that off then. And of course, I'm really hoping that Hamilton will have a modern transportation system that we'll actually see some tangible change to the way we get around. Do you want my fears? Yes, please. Okay. <laughs> um, oh, and a reduction in crime, of course. I, my fear is sort of the antithesis to what I've just said, really. My fear is that we'll get through another term of politics and housing will be no more affordable. Or we will have built poor quality communities because it's really important to me that we don't just build boxes upon boxes for people to be in but we develop strong communities where people can thrive. Um, and I also have a fear that we will miss the opportunity, if we don't embrace it very quickly, to do things better as we go forward. And some of the areas that we do need to go better outside of housing and transport would be climate and water. So I'm hoping that we embrace the challenges we have now and we don't miss the boat. Yeah. Um, uh, you heard earlier Manaki talking about the legacy of the, tr the treaty settlements for Waikato Tainui and a mention of our river settlement. And from that settlement came the concept of Te Manao Te Awa, which is now transformed into Te Manao Te Wai. Heard Bruce Clarkson stand up earlier and also talk about the, in the intimate interlinking between our, our health and wellbeing and the way we live in the environment.
environment that we live. And actually that's a very Māori worldview, a very Māori worldview that sees that actually pushed the boundaries when we did our river settlement to, to actually say to local government at the time and other authorities that what happens on the land, what happens on the whenua impacts the quality of the water and that it's all holistic. And so that we, if we want to improve and re restore and protect uh, the Modi and the mana of the river for future generations, we have to look at all of our activities on the whenua and diversity and biodiversity and so on. And so my real hope is that the people of the Waikato really start to truly appreciate what we bring to the table and um, see the value in our increased inclusion in things like co-governance, etc., and the leadership that we've actually brought, not just to Waikato, but to Aotearoa Whanui, and um, really be prepared to push the boundaries. Oh, too often we'll reach, we'll, we'll reach uh, a taumata, we'll, we'll make an achievement, and then people will get a bit nervous, or rest on laurels and say, oh, we've done that, we've changed that name, or we've done that settlement, and think that we've all done a great job, whereas for Māori, it's never enough. There's always more work to be to be done, and we're we're, we're striving for our vision in Waikato Tainui of mana motuhake for our people, where they have choices um, and for a better life, basically. And my fear is that they will not. Uh, for me, I think uh, I think one of the biggest things in the Waikato district we talk about building communities. We don't talk about building houses because we build lots of houses throughout the, the Waikato, uh, as Paula does in Hamilton here. But we talk about building communities because a house is not just a house where people reside and it's about a community and it's about building opportunity and hope. So part of what I would like to see and, and what we're trying to achieve in the Waikato is actually to try to get a more joined up opportunity for people around where they live and where they work and where they play. You know, it's an old adage, but at the end of the day, there is an opportunity to do it so you need to walk alongside industry to attract employment within the communities. So that's one of the biggest things that I get asked about. And there's lots of jobs and there's lots of companies that are struggling to find people to work in our communities at the moment in businesses. But, but at the end of the day, they still ask me the question, why am I travelling to work when I could be working in my own town? It's just don't particularly have that uh, skill set that they've got available to, to utilise in their community. So my biggest hope is that we actually do grow our communities across the Waikato, and I don't just mean the Waikato district, I mean across the whole Waikato region. And my biggest fear is that we don't achieve it. Because it's, it, it, if we don't achieve it, we will have lost a lot of hope in a lot of people. Oh, fair enough. Does anyone have a question for our, our um, mayoral forum? Before we continue on, I've got a whole bunch more questions. But if at this stage you've got something And, and I guess I want to respond to it by saying we are putting people in boxes now in their court motels. And it's, it's really quite important that we do that, get that community thing right, but it is also important that we do build enough houses along the way for people. And I think to say we can't have this kind of housing because it's not community is sometimes quite a dangerous idea. We need to really enhance the houses we are building as well as the time. Want to make that point. We can't forget about the fact that people are already in boxes. Yeah, look, that's, thanks for that, Thomas, and I'll put that voice straight away. So, yeah, look, and, and you're right. Um, I think the interesting thing is um, it's one thing to build communities, but what fits in it? So, when I look at housing today, it's almost like looking at Lego. Some people can afford bigger boxes than, than others, but you've actually got to cater for all needs. So when I look across our district and KO are building uh, or, uh, through their uh, properties they've bought uh, up at uh, Te Kapita, they are building, I think it's about 1,300 houses up there. So they're of all different shapes and sizes and ownership models up there for those people. Um, and uh, probably one of the things that I learned in the um, process working with the Comfort Group with Craig Turner uh, around bringing Sleepyhead to a Hinawai was around, Craig made a, a very telling statement to me one day, and he said, you know, his motivator and drive was not about relocating the manufacturing, that was, that was certainly part of it, but his main driver 
was actually being able to provide affordable housing for what he called his people. His people who worked in the factory could only afford housing at that stage of the value of around $550,000. Uh, 550, so that was the value of the property they're working to. And Craig's gone as far to say that he'll give any large-scale developer the money, uh, not the money, the land, on a proviso they deliver on the houses at the, in that price range. So he's, he's, he'll put his money where his mouth is and provide the free land on a proviso that those people get those houses. So, yeah, there is a, there's a whole raft of different uh, opportunities. The one that we probably are more fearful of, and probably not so much for Max, but certainly for Paul and I, is what we call the three-by-threes, which doesn't necessarily lead to a good outcome unless they're done, I think, potentially in a greenfields option versus to a brownfields option. And the brownfields, uh, which is the infill, is where you actually get the first outcomes from it compared to a greenfields where you can do the streetscape and get the thing done correctly. I guess what I would say to it is I absolutely support the intention of your statement, Thomas, that we need a, a diverse range of house typologies. We need one bedroom, we need two bedroom, we need things that we've not seen before very much of. What I would say as a caution is, yes, as we do, it's not what we do, it's how we do it. So you have to build them in ways so people can thrive which means they should have some access to some basic things that are well known to be good for, for well-being. And that's green space, that's transportation, access to doctors and shops and walkability and all of that kind of thing. Um, other countries in the world have had to respond to um, dire housing problems in the past and developed what we would now call slums. And then they've had to redevelop them all again to create villages with um, intensity, you know, with them. Um, with high intensity buildings, but round a village concept. And some parts of the world have done that very, very well where they've created communal park spaces, shared um, transportation, uh, health facilities nearby. We don't want a lot of lonely people. Um, I think Martin used the word um, elaborate rabbit hutches. We don't want that. We want a city that provides all kinds of houses but in a way where you feel like you belong to a community near you. On the topic of housing then, let's come to the question that you all um, were given beforehand, which is, have there been any programs or unique schemes happening in your communities that you would like to see increased or utilised more? And maybe we could start in the middle. Um, Linda, and then over to you yeah, next. Kia ora. Um, as, as Paula was thinking, I was just thinking about our subdivision that we created, a Tikari area just here in Hamilton. It's not far from here. And it offered a range of different um, uh, housing options. We knew as an iwi that housing, good, warm, dry housing, where people can live there for an extended period of time is a super lever for health, it's a super lever for intergenerational wealth creation, um, for better education outcomes and so on and so forth. And so we uh, exercised our right of first refusal on whenua in Kirikiriroa and um, created a, a number of different types of housing options for our people. Some of them who were, um, who were able to uh, service a mortgage but just couldn't get over that, that line of getting the deposit or just didn't know how to navigate all of the various paperwork, etc. So our team runs... Um, uh, literacy pro um, financial literacy programs and home ownership workshops and things like that to prepare people, not just say, here's a house, live in it, but prepare them for the what ifs, etc. Um, not everyone could afford to own their home outright, but many of them are, have, have been able to just service those mortgages because they've been paying exorbitant rents in Kiri Kiri Roa anyway. Um, others needed a little bit of help, so we created a shared equity scheme whereby the, the tribe offered the land and kept a proportion of it, and, um, and so, you know, they only had to pay for a, a certain percentage of, of the whenua. Um, and then we partnered with Habitat for Humanity to build um, Rent to Own, and also there's some kind of order social housing op opportunities there as well. And even though um, it's in the, it's in a, uh, a suburb of, Ham uh, of Hamilton East in Kirikiriroa here, it's like a modern day papakainga where they're all living in community, even though some come from Kafia or some come from, you know, Cambridge or whatever, in terms of 
where they traditionally come from, the Ukaipo, they, they actually live um, in community and they live in all sorts of, but you can't tell who lives where because they're all just, you know, all the kids play together, etc. And, the, and when the housing ministers came to visit it, they asked, you know, is it close to schools? It's close to Kohanga, it's close to Kura. And all, so it's really well designed um, opportunity. And I think if we are more innovative and creative in the way in which we think about housing options um, and the ranges of different types of um, solutions that we can help and, and create for our whanau, I think that that's one um, really awesome example of an opportunity that can be taken up by others. Yeah, it's interesting how things change. Um, nine years ago, uh, Otsurahonga was told, told pretty much to shut up shop because our population was declining, uh, people were leaving, as an aging population, we had no future. And we were one of the many rural communities around New Zealand that were told that, and that was nine years ago. How much has changed now to where we are at the moment? We're right in the middle of doing our town concept plan um, as I speak, and looking at whether there's, um, and focusing on a few areas, whether it's urban intensification, um, whether it's green space, and at the moment there's quite a bit of housing going on in Otsurahonga, but being mindful that in the uh, period of our long-term plan, our population is expected to increase by about a third. So there's a lot of activity going on, um, whether we can stay on top of it because we have the same issues um, as everybody else with supply chain issues, etc. But I suppose my point is for a, to be told nine years ago that there was no future for your town and just get ready for um, how you're gonna fund your infrastructure <coughs> where there is no population increase uh, to where we're looking at the exponential growth now. Um, you really have to get your head around that quickly and make those plans accordingly. So it's um, absolutely timely that our time, town concept plan is um, in the middle of it right now. And I'm really confident about the future for Otorahonga that we can actually stay on top of the needs. Yeah, look, it was, this is an interesting question because I, I saw an article, if, if you'd have read the Waikato Times, I think it was on, what's today, Tuesday? It must have been on Saturday, I think. And it referred to um, and mentioned the Waikato District Council's involvement in Iwi being able to build on Iwi multiple owned land. Now, that was a, a real long journey, which we played a big part in supporting and actually helping with staff time, uh, along with the, and I can't remember the young gentleman from Raglan that kicked it off. I remember his surname was Ormsby. Albury, 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 that was it. And what Albury did, um, and and working with our staff, and, and that was a catalyst, working with the Puni Kokri, uh, working with the, um, Maryland Court around the ability for um, Mar multiple Mary owned land to be used um, by the um, owners of it to do housing on. Now he originally started off to do it because there's multiple owned blocks in Ragland and he started off to do that for his whanau. And, and I just look at that and, when, and I'd forgotten all about it until I read that article the other day and I just thought, yeah, that's an incredible achievement and um, it's something that our uh, council was certainly very proud of our involvement and, and leading the way and that was very much recognised as we were leaders in New Zealand around that facilitating that actually happened. So, yeah. Can I just add to that? Because um, I was on the hearings panel that heard the Waikato proposed plan which is now operative. And um, to add on to the idea of being able to build on multiply owned Māori land, which comes under the jurisdiction of the Māori Land Court, we also added a new definition of treaty treaty settlement land. So it might be in general title because m much of the Waikato Rohe was confiscated land and so it's not held under Māori land tenure which comes within the jurisdiction of the Tui Whenua. So it was really important for multiply owned general land to also be able to be developed and um, uh, for, for papakaina to be created on, on that Whenua as well. And that's in the um, So some of the examples have already been given, but what I might fe uh, focus on is a couple of things that are a little different. We set up a community lands trust, which um, has recently been enabled further to um, uh, not only acquire land and take the land out of the equation, but to improve that land and leverage off that. So that I'm very hopeful that, um, as I'm sure Thomas is, that that will go from strength to strength now. The other interesting thing is that in order to deliver results, you really need to have partnerships because you need land and developers 
and um, links to who needs the housing to get the successful outcome. So we've established in the Fairfield Enderley area a partnership with Kind Aura. We've signed an agreement to work through the issues for Te Papa Nui Enderley. And we lean in and partner with Waikato Tainui, Kohau Health, so Papua New Enderley House, and a whole bunch of other people to ensure that the development is fit for purpose in that area and that it offers a mixed typology of housing. So that will have all of those elements that Linda was talking about before. It'll have ownership, a portion of ownership homes. It'll have some rented homes, and then the others may be leased to, leased to own or rent to own, or some some kind of mechanism like that. So you'll, you'll get um, communities uh, aspiring to different types of property as they go forward, and that's really quite exciting. Um, so um, I, I'm, I'm very hopeful that by working with Kaingora we can get good outcomes, because we all know from watching the news and reading the paper that whenever Kaingora step up to do a development, it gets an unnecessary amount of backlash and, and um, un helpful comments when we're talking about people and we're talking about people who need homes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, one more thing. I, fr from um, an Otorohonga perspective, I actually really feel for um, Waikato and District in Hamilton and Waipa, actually. Um, the challenges when you've got exponential growth that these districts have and the change to your social fabric in your communities um, and the challenge around that. Like, the, the reason why people are in um, Otorohonga, the reason why they stay in Otorohonga is because they love the community um, aspect and the feel and the specialness of, um, I suppose, the togetherness. And a huge fan of organic growth where it just happens and people embed themselves in a community and become a part of that. And as soon as you speed that process up too fast, you lose that integrity. And I'm not saying it's happened in Hamilton or the Waikato districts, that would be unfair. But it, I'm fearful of that in our own community, that I hope that the, the growth does stay somewhat organic and we can manage it and um, keep that spirit that we've always had. Yeah, look, just in closing, one thing's for sure that, that I identified quite a while ago was the fact that how we've normally done business around housing needs to change and we need to think outside the, the box. So that what I referred to was, as I said, was a, uh, a young man who wanted to do something for his whanau is actually, uh, is actually proved to be a, a worthy case for the rest of New Zealand and multiple owned land. But you've actually got to think of other ways to actually house people other than traditional ways and models. And if you've ever been lucky enough to go and look at uh, what they and how they house people in Singapore, it's a, a, absolutely an amazing um, uh, opportunity to, to see how they do it. So they've done it vertically, gone up, but they build communities and skyscrapers and, and, and at ground level uh, with all the facilities, including shops, schools, the whole nine yards. So you create a, effectively a, a community um, or would say a portion of, of Singapore, um, which uh, goes up and, um, and it seems to work really well. And I think, and I've sort of been talking around this around the, the table through both Future Proof and through the Mirror Forum that as a country, we need to also look to going up in different ways and not just out because we just don't have enough land. We're not Australia, we don't have an endless supply of desert, um, but what we do is, um, is change the way we do things. I think that's my quote of the day, we're not Australia. Okay. <laughs> Look, we, we aren't going to have time to go through all of the questions, so what I would like to do is to offer each of you a chance to talk about one more topic of your choice that you may have come prepared to just have a little chat about. Um, Paula, is it okay if we start with you? Cool, I'll talk about the climate one then. I thought you might. Yeah, yeah. so I mentioned. Um, the question was, um, what were the conversations we're hearing out in the community about it? And I thought, well, that was a very interesting way, way to express the question. And I recalled back at the last election, of course we're facing into a new one now, but the last election the voice was really loud and really strong. You, I don't know, where you, you'd have had to have been hiding in the back of your garden not to have noticed the strong voice, especially of the youth of our city and around New Zealand who marched on climate issues um, and asked us to do things like respond to a climate emergency, to declare a climate emergency or to get cracking with actually some uh, climate action plans, some tangible actions. Uh, since then, of course, we've had all been locked out, locked down at home with Zoom, and various things have happened. 
I haven't seen that same sense of um, uh, urgency out in the community, although I expect to see it as we approach the elections, both local government and national. But what I am seeing is a huge call for change in the mode shift area, where that's where people are expressing their concerns. We need to get people out of their reliance on single occupancy private vehicles, and we need to move into walking and have walkable community, communities. Uh, that's hence our 10 minute neighborhood, our 20 minute city, that kind of thing. Biking has changed. Uh, but we need to do more, and um, that includes cycle networks, walking networks, and looking at what the new modes of transport coming up. Uh, EVs, or hydrogen, electric trams, who knows? But whatever we, we, we uh, need, we need to be thinking about it right now. Council has, um, has listened to, count, uh, to people and got cracking with our... Um, first of all, we did a uh, audit of our emissions as a council, and then we've made a climate action uh, plan, which just went through council far too late, but it's at least better late than never. It went through council just recently, and there's a climate action strategy with the implementation that's coming to council next month, Martin. So Martin Gallagher and Sarah Thompson have been taking a key lead. Uh, it, it does, I would say that is excellent work. I would also say that we need to do more across more areas of our City. The other area that we do focus our climate action about, because it's probably the easier one, is green space. So we've put more money into gully restoration than we ever have in the history of council and to the extension of our green space. Thank you to government for things like Jobs for Nature, which got us cracking in some of our gully ways. Um, we've got, like um, uh, Bruce was talking um, recently about Lake Waifakariki, the Waifakariki Natural Heritage Park. You know, when you consider the 14 years ago, that was bare paddock, and now look at the legacy, environmental legacy that creates. Having said that, that is not going to get us to where we need to be with our carbon emissions. So I'm not trying to fob you off by saying we've done some mode shift and we've done some green space. I'm acknowledging the, the huge extent of the program uh, that we've got ahead of us, the problem, the challenge. And Sarah and Martin are very focused on informing the next district plan in terms of things like wise water use, so we don't waste water, so we collect rainwater, we recycle grey water, we have sustainability in the houses, more solar, more electric vehicles, shareable vehicles, things like Mevo. So there's a whole lot in the mix. So I don't want to sit here and make, you, uh, make ourselves sound like we've, we're brilliant, we've done it, but I want to acknowledge the challenge and say that we have set a foundation for change. Would that be right, Martin? Hmm. Well, I'm glad you talked about climate change. If you didn't, I would have. So I'm going to say tautoko katoa. Um, for for Waikato Tainui, some of the big issues around climate change are um, the impact on our coastal marae um, and also our, our farmers, you know, who suffer the droughts and the floods and, and access to water in the future. But what I'll talk about and see it in detail, uh, well, a little bit more detail, is the importance of data. And that's something we talk a lot about in, around the table at Waikato Tainui, um, is the importance of getting really good, accurate data. And we have data experts within our iwi and also across Aotearoa in the Iwi Leaders Forum. And um, one of the pushes now is for Māori to be intimately involved in the collecting of data for the next census. Last time was a complete and utter fail, and we don't have good data to, to, to focus our, our energies. As um, one of the earlier speakers say, we, we struggle to prioritise what we put our time and energy and resource into, but if we have really good data, then we know what our people's needs are and where we can focus um, for the best outcomes. So I think that's, that's something that I think we need to, you know, we want to be included and we want a buy Māori for Māori approach across the board, but that's one area where we have been excluded um, for far too long and, and a lot of iwi now are asking to be um, uh, included in the collection processes and also the explaining to our people of why it's important. If we know what the housing needs are, then we know what sort of houses, housing um, solutions we need to push for and where. I'm just going to add to something that's already been said today, and I suppose it's the purpose of why we're here. We're here because of the Waikato Plan. And like a lot of us, or some of us in the room, there was a wee bit of scepticism when the Waikato Plan first uh, got underway. Um, 
Margaret, I'll thank you again for the last two years. As um, was mentioned earlier, for the progress you've made on the Waikato Plan and the delivery of it, and for everybody to get an understanding of the purpose of the Waikato Plan. When we listened to Minister Mahuta's presentation earlier, she's uh, making a lot of calls about where the changes are, um, a lot of talk around three waters, which therefore, as we start talking about the three waters, then what is that um, being replaced with? And I think all the work streams that we've been doing in the Waikato Plan here are incredibly relevant to where the, the changing purpose of delivery of local government is in the coming years. And I think while all of us are in this room, we've got to get our heads around that and we've actually got to lead that. And the Waikato Plan has been the perfect forum for leading the change of local government. And it's a great example of what can be done through a collaborative approach between different agencies and between iwi and between local government. It's really, really important that we actually further embrace what we've done here and make sure we get some clear momentum going forward because if we want to be prepared for those changes which Minister Mahuta referred to happening in a couple of years' time, then we've got to be on the front foot of that now so we can benefit to the greatest degree from those opportunities that put before us. So, hey, everybody who's working in the work streams, um, great work, keep it up, and let's hope we can make some um, further progress in the coming years. Kia ora. Yeah, look, um, that's the same one I was going to pick, Max, so I'm still going to do it, though, <laughs> because it's important to me. Um, in my second term as mayor, I took on the role as chair of the Waikato Mirror Forum, which was 2013 to 16. And that was at the start of the work where we created as a work stream the um, Waikato Plan. It's fair to say the Waikato Plan didn't get a, a very good start. And, and there was a number of reasons why it didn't get, get a good start, but, so I won't talk about those. But what happened in that, in that journey, probably around about the end of 2015, beginning of 2016, I said to my fellow mayors one day, we're trying to arrange a meeting together and everybody was busy and we couldn't do it. So I said, right, you're gonna to have to give up a Saturday or a Sunday. So we gave up a Saturday, I think, from memory. We all met at Carapero with consultants and we actually kick-started it again. We gave it a good kick to get it going and got a strategy on how we were gonna take it forward. And part of that strategy was to actually, uh, and what was partly wrong with it is the mayors weren't sitting at the table like they should have been. So some of us went back to sit at the top table and participate and get some go forward. It's not to say it wasn't an easy journey. There was a lot of tension. There was tension between those around the table. There was tension with iwi and who represented iwi and who had the right to speak for iwi. There was a whole lot of things. But we left it up to iwi to sort their own in-house politics out over that part of it. But from there on, it actually started to grow. And it used to start to grow a bit of legs. And part of that was through its leadership. And I referred to two Margarets here. Um, Margaret Devlin, and uh, uh, Margaret's not in the room, I don't think, otherwise I would have seen her at um, Smoko. But Margaret actually started it off, and it was, and she did it as a favour to me. Uh, I asked her to take on that mantle as chair, or co-chair of it, and she took that on. And she got it moving to a point where it was actually starting to uh, get some real momentum and go forward. And then I asked another friend of mine, Margaret Wilson, to take over. And, uh, and Margaret's here today, I've been sitting beside her this afternoon, and I just want to acknowledge Margaret. Margaret's, uh, along with the people around her, like Max and others that sit around that table, have taken it to another dimension. And I look to the, some of the achievements it's actually made, but the one that's been more telling, it's been talked about here this afternoon, is a, around the work that Lalia Ramir did in relation to housing. Taking, doing a stock take on housing in the Waikato, what are we short of and where are we short of it, more importantly? That work, has actually been recognised at a ministerial level and has been presented to the ministers um, and they are very, very interested in that work because they actually see us achieving something and giving them a way forward to actually deliver on their own policy around houses and where they should go. So that, that has been a big catalyst um, for um, keeping it going. I think the next, when I, when I was thinking about this question and, and where, do, where do we go with the Waikato plan going forward, for my mind, um, it's done a great job in that area and it will continue to do so because of that is far from going to be complete in the next decade. But I look to other challenges within the Waikato and this is where, when the Waikato plan was set up, it was basically set up to collate data and find those touch points that we could use through the Merrill Forum for the region to actually um, press government's buttons. So the housing ones really worked well and got a great outcome. 
I would, I would suggest, and, and Lisa was up here talking from um, DHB, which is no more, um, and I think the next big challenge is us having a voice at that table around health. Really do, across the region. And I, and I had a meeting with Margaret the other day, and I said I would say this, is, is that we need to focus on what are the needs within the Waikato and how do, do, how do we deliver those at a community level. And I think there's a huge hole, I know, in my district around delivery, and as there probably is across the greater Waikato. So I think that's a challenge I would put to the Waikato plan is to turn its focus now from housing, um, not, not losing sight of it, but challenge it to actually look at health overall and take that forward. Because just remember, if they collate the data we need and the evidence, and it's evidence-based, the same as Lali's work, that's the stuff, as mayors, we take to Wellington. And that's the stuff we, we bang away in ministers' ears. And that's where we get our traction. Why? Because we've got the evidence. We've got the data. We use it. And a lot of that data hasn't been collected. And I think there's a great opportunity. Lastly, I, and, I, and, I, and I was here to hear Barry talk, and Barry, that was a good, good um, discussion there, Barry, in your speech, and, and Chris sitting beside him. Um, they are the custo current custodians at an at administrative level for uh, the Waikato plan. Um, but it's still, in my mind, for Max, myself, and Paula, and uh, for Barry, it's still a piece of what I am uh, in relation to the Waikato Mural Forum, and we'll never lose sight of it. Um, and the only thing I would say to Chris and Barry, just make sure it's resourced at a level it can deliver on for the, for the region, because it is a regional tool which we can actually use for the betterment of our um, communities. So, yeah, we're on. Please have a round of applause for our <laughs> Thank you so very much. Um, Thank you for being here on stage with us. I'm going to ask you to just stay comfortable on the stage because we've got one short address to wrap us up for the end of the day. So let's, let's keep the stage nice and warm as... Um, the Chief Executive of Waikato Regional Council, Chris McClay, comes to, um, to speak to us. After Chris has given his address, we have a few thank yous for the end of our day, and then we will pass the time over to Matua Sunny to close us with karakia. Kia ora. Yeah, kia ora tatai katoa, uh, ko Chris McClay aho. Um, look, I've got the privilege of the last comments uh, for the day, as well as I've had the privilege of hosting the Waikato plan over the last few years at the Waikato Regional Council. It's noteworthy the number of people and the different organisations who have joined us today. It just goes to show the success of the things that uh, has just been mentioned on stage now. There's no equivalent to this collaboration in other regions and this is something that makes our region unique and we should celebrate that. This goes to the particular value that the Waikato Regional Council sees in the Waikato plan and its work. As the saying goes, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts, and together the Waikato plan partners have made significant headway for the region in a number of areas that we've heard about throughout the day today. Importantly, it shows the value of working together, and by working together with common goals, we can achieve some great outcomes for our region. It's also demonstrated the value of leadership the Waikato plan is deepening the region's reputation with ministers and central government agencies. And look, we had two uh, members of parliament here today and the minister opening us today. And as we talk together across councils, iwi, government and non-government groups, and we can work together to respond and deliver on regionally significant issues. Some of the best examples of the Waikato plan's work are, as we've just heard, about the regional housing initiative and the work they do alongside the Waikato Wellbeing Project. Central Government has been impressed by our collective determination to make progress with targeted focus areas. Central Government agencies are now also key members of the Leadership Committee, and isn't that wonderful? The Waikato Plan umbrella has also provided for stronger understanding and relationships among agencies who are members of the Leadership Committee and its Strategic Partners Forum, including a deeper understanding of each agency's business and where synergies can be achieved for the benefit of the region. Some of the things I noted from today, it was wonderful to hear from the Minister Nanaya Mahuta. In fact, wasn't it good to reflect that she had COVID and could still talk with us today? 
I think it demonstrated the res resilience that we, we now have in our communities. And I think it's been, we should celebrate the fact that the Waikato plan has remained resilient and continued over the last couple of years. We also said, as uh, Max Baxter referred to, the Minister talked about the value of local responses and collaboration to find workable solutions to some of these complex and difficult issues that we have to deal with. And the, and the Minister referred to the importance of working across in in interdependencies of wellbeing. Don't just look at each wellbeing outcome on its own. We all join together. I noted uh, Margaret Wilson and her desire to learn from today. I think there's been great vibe in here today, um, and that itself will be a learning of the success and, and get learnings for going forward. But her challenge to try and find the right leadership vehicle to take the Waikato plan forward. Something that Alan, you also referred to. I'd have to say that a, a wonderful quote that Rachel Apiaki uh, raised in the, uh, one of the forums this morning, and Barry Quayle referred to it, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. But there was a sequel to it as well, because later she said, if you're at the table and you're reading the menu, that means you're not at the table. Makes you wonder if you're on the, on the menu that you're reading. But in other words, you need to be contributing and not just sitting around there for the uh, dust to be seen. At the Climate Forum, they talked about the importance of focusing on society and not just the economy. Let's not talk about low emission economies, low carbon economies. Let's talk about low emission societies and low carbon societies and so on. And as a result, you'll get a better economy going forward. And finally, the, the uh, workshop this afternoon where they talked about the landscape of the Waikato plan in the future, it painted a landscape that the leadership group of the Waikato plan need to make sure the scope stays focused not on today's issues, but on the issues that our rangatahi are going to be facing in years to come. So for those of you who have been keeping up to date with the central government reforms, you'll have seen that the government is signalling more regionalised models of working together towards shared outcomes, and this direction is right where the Waikato plan is and can continue to be. We'll therefore be looking to all the partners for continued support of the work and how the sentiment and aspirations of the Waikato plan and its partners working together can continue. I look forward to continuing those conversations with you. So I want to thank the Minister Nanaia Mahuta for the keynote speech this morning. I want to thank, as others have done, Margaret Wilson for her expert chairing and with others of the Waikato Plan in continuing the spirit of collaboration that the partners of the Waikato Plan have worked very hard to maintain. Margaret, your support and guidance has been invaluable to the partnership. And I do recall when I first started the role a couple of years ago that you were one of the first people to come into the office and, and I think that you were wondering you know, what the direction was going to be and you promised to breathe a little bit more life into it with just a little bit more resource, and you've done exactly that. I want to acknowledge Desiree Frisk, who's done a lot of the, the legwork behind it all and support for the, uh, the Waikato Plan Leadership uh, Group and the committee uh, that services and council. And I just want to acknowledge her for the work and just putting to, uh, the symposium together today. It's, uh, I know she works tirelessly. And the support she's had from Tracy May, uh, Lisette Balsam and others at the, at the council. I want to thank you, Shelley, uh, for keeping the smooth order of the day, the humour you've injected and reminding us about our pronunciation. Um, I suppose the final word I'd give to you would be kia ora, as you taught us at the start of the day. And finally, thank you all. The Waikato plan is you, it is yourselves, it's people who make things happen. Thank you for attending today. Thanks for your particip participation and support. Kia ora. I have to leave some more just to say thank you for your words and all of your work. And then I'm going to ask if you wouldn't mind taking that seat that I've been warming for you just there for a moment. Thank you so much. So um, really, Chris has acknowledged um, many of the people who need to be acknowledged as our day comes to a close. Um, Margaret has received many acknowledgements today and so um, I'm going to continue on through my list. We just would like to um, thank the Waikato Regional Council 
the Waikato Plan Leadership Committee. We'd like to thank Waikato University for the staff, the space, the technology, the recordings today. It's been a beautiful venue and we've been very well taken care of. Nā reira pēnā, koutou pēnā, um, koutou i te mana ki tāna. We would really like to acknowledge and thank all of our panellists for giving of their time and their expertise, our MCs of the various sessions for the day. And I would like to invite, please, to the stage, I know they're going to love it, the Waikato Plan staff, Jamie Hodge, Carly Cook, Lisa Toon, and Michelle Howie. Please come on down. Are they even in here or are they hiding? And while you're at it, Desiree, you can come and join them too. Can we please give them a round of applause? conductor of an orchestra. If you stand behind the seats, we're going to end up with a beautiful photo. And it will also be a lovely way to just give one last round of applause as well. <laughs> They've done so well looking after us today. Lisa, thank you so much. And Desiree especially. I don't think this woman has slept in months. <laughs> And so um, uh, I'll come and stand here with you. If we're getting any photos taken now would be the chance or our photographer's up here. I don't know how that's going to work. <laughs> One final round of applause, please, everybody. <laughs> Beautiful. And we will stand here and warm the stage while Matua Sunny comes up and does. Brings our day to a close. Tēnā koe matua. Tēnā no tātou katu. I am here in the Kyokui, Margaret Paulson, more a member of the Ropu Waikato plan. Nami Hoki Kyokoto, Banaki Nai, the Tangata, Irungano, in a Tikanga, Kuima, Kuruma, Kurumo, here, Matu, Mito Aroha, the Nate Mihi Maiwa Kyatato Kato. Ah, pai rau e te ahua o te whakaaro nui me te tuakana, me te teina, tēnei te mihi ati ki a tātou katoa. Nō reira e rauranga tira mā, ka whakakapi i ki nei hui. Ki a tau ki a tātou katoa, te ato whai o tō tātou ariki a hiu kuraiti, me te aroha o te atua, me te whiwhi tahitanga ki te wairu o tapi, ake, ake, āmene. E te whānau, you are all welcome to join us for drinks and nibbles in the foyer. Stay as long as you like. We'll tell you if it's really become time that you have to leave. Please enjoy yourselves. Nei rā te mihi, tēnā koutou.